Hey everyone, my name is Caitlin and I manage social media here at Divers Alert Network. And today we are really excited to launch our first webinar in a series of many that we hope to have coming out to you guys in the next couple of weeks. But today I'm here with Chloe and she's from our risk mitigation team. She's going to tell you guys all about disinfecting dive gear in the wake of this COVID-19 pandemic. Hey, Chloe. Hey, Caitlin. So as Caitlin said, my name is Chloe and I am the coordinator of the risk mitigation department here at Dan. Um, so this is gonna be a PowerPoint presentation to everybody who is wondering about gear disinfectant infection, um, what types of disinfectants to use, what should I be disinfecting? And this is really designed to target those of you who are going to be diving in the future once all of the restrictions are lifted. So let me just share my screen and we will get started. All right, so disinfecting scuba equipment. So I think we've all heard of the coronavirus or COVID-19, you know, by now. Um, the COVID-19 is the name of the disease that is caused by the coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2. All right, and this is a coronavirus, which gets its name from the proteins that stud its surface and make it look kind of like a crown. And this is in a class of viruses called um, enveloped viruses or viruses that have a viral envelope, which is actually really important when we talk about disinfection. And it's spread by, by droplets when people cough or sneeze or talk. So an enveloped virus is a class of virus that has this fatty or lipid viral envelope that surrounds the contents of the virus. And it actually functions to protect the virus when it's outside of a host. So like when you do sneeze or cough and expel the virus, it's going to be in its enveloped state. And the viral envelope is pretty easily damaged, which is good news for us because that means that it's easy to kill or reduce the infectivity of this virus. So the reason that this is important is because when we damage the viral envelope, we are going to damage the contents of the virus. So we're gonna be removing or damaging this protective kind of coating that will let whatever disinfectant you're using get inside the virus and damage the contacts, contents. Um, it means that it can't infect anyone anymore and it will die. Um, when a viral envelope is aerosolized um, for a while or if it's on a surface for a while, it can also dry out instead of being damaged. So it can um, kind of die that way as well. So when we're talking about the new coronavirus or COVID-19, um, survival times are really, really important. Um, so what we know about SARS-CoV-2, this current coronavirus, is pretty limited. And then you, as you guys probably know, um, all of this information is developing day by day. So we're learning new things every day. But what we do know about the actual virus right now is that it can survive for two to three days on plastic and steel, four hours in copper, three hours in its aerosolized form, such as from a cough or sneeze, and 24 hours on cardboard. Now, obviously this isn't a ton of information and it doesn't really do us a lot of good. So we look to other similar viruses. And here we have a study that was conducted on human coronavirus 229E and SARS-CoV-1, which was the cause of the SARS outbreak in 2003, 2004. Um, and this is very, very, very closely related to the virus that's going around now. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of variation in these survival times. Um, they're similar, but they're not exactly the same. When we're talking about virus survival time on fabric, which is important for, you know, wetsuits or BCDs or other, you know, fabric things that you might have in your equipment, there's really not a lot of data. There's no data on the current coronavirus survival on fabrics. And in terms of other vi viruses with a viral envelope, I could only find one study that said that another virus would survive for one day on denim. So this is one reason that it's really, really important to practice disinfection because we don't really know how long this stuff is gonna survive and what's gonna kind of cause that envelope to dry out or what's gonna kill the virus if we're not using a disinfectant. So why is disinfection important? Well, it's for the reason I just said, we don't really know how long the virus is gonna survive on our, sc on our scuba equipment. Um, 
It's also gonna give us a quicker turnaround if we're using rental equipment and reduce the risk of transmission of COVID-19 between divers on equipment. So what should we disinfect? Definitely any rental equipment that's gonna come into contact with people's eyes and face and mouth. So these mucous membranes that you have in your eyes and your nose and mouth that are gonna cause the transfer of the virus. Um, that includes masks, snorkels, regulators, and BCD oral inflators if you've orally inflated. Um, any equipment that's shared should definitely be dis disinfected and equipment that's touched a lot. So here we're talking about the outside of cylinders like the hand wheel, um, fill stations, the knobs to control fill stations, um, maybe even the fill whip. So anything that's being touched a lot. So we're going to talk about five types or methods of disinfection um, in this presentation. So the first one is going to be heat. So we've gotten quite a few questions about heat, and most of them are um, about compressors and using hot water to disinfect. So can I use hot water to disinfect a regulator? Theoretically, you could. Is this the best way to do it? Maybe not. Um, temperatures surrounding you know, when the coronavirus will die are pretty inconsistent. So knowing how hot you would have to heat your hot water is kind of hard to say. Um, it also could be hot enough to damage the equipment. And soaking time is probably gonna be pretty long between 15 and 30 minutes. So this might not be the best way to go about disinfection. Um, another question we've gotten is, can the coronavirus enter a compressor? Can it get into my cylinders? Can it survive? Um, we don't believe that the virus will survive compression, but it can enter the compressor because some of the viral particles can be very, very small. Um, when your air is going through compression, the actual gas is going to heat up to about 150 degrees Fahrenheit, but during each stage you're going to get really, really high peak temperatures that can reach up to, up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, and we don't believe that the virus will survive this. It can get into a cylinder though, theoretically, if you were to have, you know, not washed your hands and your hands are contaminated with the virus and you touch the, the cylinder valve or the fill whip where they couple and the virus could be blown inside of the cylinder. Um, there's no data about survival of the coronavirus inside a cylinder, but there are viruses that can withstand that kind of pressure. So, you know, we can't say whether it will or will not survive this. So we have to assume that it will and disinfect you know, to, to prevent that. So this is also applicable for when you are um, assembling your equipment. If you touch the inside of the first stage of the regulator in the cylinder valve, you know, you could, you could potentially get the virus that way. Um, so disinfection of parts that are touched a lot is really important. Um, but the main way to prevent this is to really just avoid touching, you know, the cylinder valve or the inside of the fill whip or the inside of that first stage of the regulator, um, because that will prevent the virus from potentially being blown into the cylinder or into the regulator. And most importantly, make sure that you're washing your hands a lot, you know, while you're touching all of these high touch areas. So soap and water. We've gotten the question, if soap and water is okay for my hands, why is it not okay for my equipment? And the answer is that it is okay for your equipment. So what's gonna happen? is the water or the soap molecules are gonna make something called a micelle. So it's got the, the, the head of the molecule, which likes water, and the tail of the molecule, which doesn't like water. And you guys can see that right here in this bottom right-hand diagram. And what's gonna happen is that non-polar or water-fearing tail can actually get inside that fatty viral envelope and start to break it apart. But that really only happens, say, if you're washing your hands, if the virus is kind of plainly just sitting on your skin. If it is contained within dirt or a skin cell, um, it's not going to work that way. What the micelle is actually going to do is surround the, the dirt or whatever and lift it off of your skin and wash it away with the water. So if you're getting a bucket of soapy water and just putting a mask or a second stage regulator in there, it probably won't work to reliably move all of the viruses. So what you need to do is um, pair it with mechanical action. So like the action of washing your hands or the action of scrubbing with a soft toothbrush. 
Where second stage regulators are concerned, this probably isn't super, you know, the best way to do it because you'd have to actually take apart the second stage regulator to get into all of those little cracks and crevices that could potentially be contaminated. So bleach is a really, really great way to go about disinfection. Um, it actually destroys the proteins and the genome of the virus because it's an oxidant, so it's going to kind of burn that stuff up. The CDC has a recipe on their website for a disinfectant solution, which is one third cup of bleach into a gallon of water, and you can increase that or decrease that as much as you want, just as long as it's about a four to 100 solution. Um, if you use hot water with bleach, it's going to actually decompose the bleach, so you want to use room temperature water. And you never want to mix this with other chemicals. You know, mix it fresh whenever you're going to use it, so you wouldn't want to mix this bleach solution in the morning and leave it for all of your customers to, to wash their gear in it all day, because the bleach is going to decompose because a chemical reaction is what's going on. Um, and so some of that bleach is going to be used up throughout the day. Some of that bleach is going to be used up um, through its reaction with the heat from the sun. Um, you also want to make sure you're wearing, you know, proper PPE, proper gloves and a mask, and rinse your gear very thoroughly after bleach and allow it to air dry. Because what happens is if there is any active ingredient left on your equipment, allowing it to dry will deactivate the rest of it. So you won't have a chance of that bleach smell or getting the active ingredient in your mouth or on your face. Quaternary ammonium compounds are going to be um, hydrophobic compounds. So it's like the tail of that micelle that we were just talking about in soap. Um, so it's going to attack the fatty envelope of this virus and kind of break it apart and disorganize it, causing the contents of the virus to leak out. Um, they're really, really common in cleaning solutions, but they are harmful to the aquatic environment. So you want to make sure that you're disposing of any solutions you mix um, carefully. Next, we have alcohol. This is going to work a lot like bleach by destroying proteins and the genome of the virus. Um, the CDC recommends using hand sanitizer of at least 60%. And then whenever they talk about cleaning surfaces, they recommend at least 70%. Um, the contact time here will vary. For hand sanitizer, I've seen 30 seconds. For surfaces, I've seen one minute. Um, it's maybe not the best thing to use on your equipment because it can degrade these soft parts of the equipment like O-rings. Um, and you want to make sure you never use it near a fill station or a heat source. Um, if you're using hand sanitizer before filling cylinders, you want to make sure that your hands are completely dry, that all of that alcohol has evaporated, um, and that you're not getting any of those alcohol vapors in or near the fill station or even when you're putting together your, your you're attaching your regulator to your cylinder. Um, and obviously you don't want to put on a bunch of hand sanitizer and then go and go because that's a huge fire hazard as well. So choosing a disinfectant, especially a disinfectant solution like a spray or something you can mix, um, you need to make sure that it is on list N, which has been put out by the EPA. These are dis disinfectants that have been proven to kill this virus. Um, and there's a, you know, a list out there that you can kind of go through and, and pick one. The most important thing is that you follow the directions, especially if it's not ready to use. If you're getting a gallon of this disinfectant and you have to mix it with water to create the dilution that you want, you really, really need to follow the directions and make sure you're not putting too much or too little and you're soaking your equipment for the time specified in the directions. This part is very important. And as always, rinse it thoroughly and let it dry afterwards. Um, if you can't find one of these registered disinfectants, um, the CDC's bleach recipe is a great one to use. And it's, it's very weak. It's a very weak uh, recipe. And so we don't believe it's going to harm your equipment. So. Is my chosen disinfectant safe to use on scuba equipment? So this is applicable to um, you know, a, a solution, a ready-made solution. What you're gonna wanna do, and I'm just gonna warn you guys right now, this is, um, I'm about to kind of walk you through the process of checking if your um, disinfectant is safe to use on scuba equipment. 
It's a little bit confusing. It's a little bit technical, but just bear with me. We're almost done with the presentation and we'll get to questions right after. So list N on the EPA's website is sorted by brand name. I'm sorry, that's wrong. The EPA on the list N on the EPA's website is not sorted by brand name. It's sorted by basic product. So what happens is one manufacturer might make a product and then sell the recipe to another manufacturer, another brand, and then they put their name on this solution. So some of these, so for example, Simple Green um, is not going to be registered on the EPA's website as Simple Green. It might be registered as something else. But if you go to the American Chemistry Council's website, the Center for Biocide Chemistries has a version of List N that is sorted by brand name. So it is much easier to search and much easier to use. You're going to need to find the EPA registration number for this product and then find its original registration documents. And that's what I'm gonna show you how to do. So just bear with me. So Simple Green D Pro 5 is on the EPA's list N. And I've got a screenshot here. This is the American, the Center for Biocide Chemistry's list. And if you guys can read this or not, you know, it doesn't really matter. This is just what the page is going to look like. And this column on the left is gonna be the product name. So here I've highlighted Simple Green D Pro 5. The middle is the distributor. And then this right-hand column is the registration number. And the registration number is 6836-140-56782, okay? The part of the registration number I've highlighted in blue here is the original registration number. The part I've highlighted in black is the distributor registration number. So this means that Sunshine Makers, the makers of Simple Green D Pro 5, have bought this recipe from someone else. Okay, so when you look up your EPA registration number, it's only going to be these two first two sets of numbers. So we're going to look up 6836-140. So here is a screenshot of the EPA's search. They're, it's called the search for registered pesticide products. And this is what just what it's going to look like after you've put in your registration number. And down here is a list of all of its registrations. And I'm going to do the most recent one, which was published on January 31st, 2019. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. Now, here is a screenshot of page six. And I know you guys probably can't read that. And again, it doesn't really matter. But this entire page is the list of acceptable uses for this product, all right? And the most important thing that I'm looking for here is for it to either say scuba equipment, dive equipment, respirators, breathing apparatus, you know, terminology like that. And you can also go by um, the raw product that your scuba equipment is made of. If it specifies that, that's okay too. So this part that I've highlighted here is where it says, this product can be used to clean and disinfect firefighting air masks, and then also half mask respirators, full face breathing apparatus, gas masks. So I know that this product is safe to use on respirators, which means it's safe to use on scuba equipment. So hopefully you guys are okay with this. Um, if you need help you know, looking something up, you can contact me, um, and I will give you that contact information at the end of the presentation. So some of these products will have different dilutions that you can make, or they will specify different soaking times. And this is where the EPA's version of List N comes in handy. So I just Googled EPA List N, and it comes up with you know, the website, and I type in the registration number, which was again 6836-140, and it pulls up this product. And as you guys can see, the product name is S-21F, so that's the original product from Lonza Formulations that they have allowed Simple Green to use. And when we're disinfecting for coronavirus, we are going to follow the directions for preparation for the following virus, which is norovirus, and the contact time is 10 minutes. So I know this is a little bit confusing, but this is the process that you have to go through when you're choosing a disinfectant from list N. You have to make sure that it's safe to use on scuba equipment. So best practice here is going to be to use a disinfectant that is on list N and that has been proven to work. 
you're going to want to rinse and allow the equipment to air dry before you use it. And then you really want to make sure that you're not recontaminating this equipment. So touching mouthpieces and masks and stuff with unwashed hands. Um, make sure you know you're you're maintaining that good hygiene. Wipe down high touch surfaces. This can be countertops, um, credit card machines, fill stations, especially the knobs to control you know air filling, um, bathrooms, all of this kind of stuff. Um, cylinders even in the hand wheel. You really want to make sure that these things are being disinfected often. So before I open it up to questions, I just want to bring your attention to two emails. So first we have risk mitigation at dan.org. This is how you're going to contact the risk mitigation team. And these are for any questions about disinfection. So anything that I've said today, any questions that I don't answer in the question part of this coming up, um, dive safety, you know, plans moving forward. All of that kind of stuff can go to risk mitigation at dan.org. For medical questions, I'm sorry, I can't answer those. You know, I'm not on the medic team. I, I'm, I don't know, probably don't know the answers to any of the, these questions that you would have. So you'll want to email medic at dan.org to get those answers. Um, so with that, we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions. All right, so um, one of our first questions from our audience is asking about the uh, bleach solution. And they want to know, let's see, it's Rebecca. Sorry, I just lost it. So she's asking, how long is the solution good before the bleach decomposes to uselessness? So I guess she's really asking, um, when you make a fresh bleach solution, how long is that going to last? Do you need to replace it every day? Yeah, what are our recommendations on you, that? That's going to really depend on the conditions. So things that decompose the active ingredient, which is so sodium hypochlorite, are going to be organic matter. So like if, I know this is gross, but like if you have a really snotty mask, all of that organic matter from that snot is going to decompose the bleach, heat from sunlight. So really best practice here is going to be like if you have multiple boats going out and people are coming back just before each wave of people coming back to rinse their equipment, just make a new bucket of your bleach solution and you should be fine. Perfect. And David is asking, what about peroxide? I use hydrogen peroxide for cleaning my kitchen and it's more environmentally friendly. Do we recommend using hydrogen peroxide? Yeah, as I, hydrogen peroxide is like, is an oxidant too. I believe it's like kind of a bleaching solution. Um, I haven't looked into this specifically, but it might, you know, dry out some of those components, um, those softer components like alcohol would. But yeah, I, I actually haven't had that question yet, so I haven't had a chance to look into it. But I can, if you email me at risk mitigation at dan.org, I can definitely look into that for you. Perfect. And another question is that steramine is widely used in the dive industry, especially in the rebreather community yeah. to sanitize parts. And a lot of people use it on mouthpieces and regulators for rental equipment because it is food safe. It's used in a lot of veterinary contexts as well. Um, do you recommend using steramine to sanitize against coronavirus? Sure, so steramine is actually not on list M. Um, so we can't recommend it for use um, to fight coronavirus. It is a sanitizer. And so sanitizing and disinfecting are different. Um, sanitizing is like a lesser version of disinfection, basically. And there's no studies that Steramine or other companies have done to see if it really is effective. Um, so Steramine probably isn't the best product for you to be using. For general sanit sanitization, it's probably fine. But for actual disinfection of scuba equipment, it's not going to be the best product. Got it. And speaking of disinfectant for scuba equipment, Morgan is asking, would you be concerned that disinfectants might eat equipment? And how about it eating away neoprene? Yeah, so if, so that's again where you would want to go into the, um, you know, we look at the EPA registration number and then you find its original registration on the EPA website. And it's going to have, you know, that long list that I screenshotted. I mean, I can even go back to that page. Um, and all of that was products and types of materials that this is safe to be used on. So if you're worried about a specific, you know, component like neoprene, you would want to go to that um, registration and see if it's safe to use. 
in general, if it says this is safe to use on respirators and stuff, you would know that it's safe to use on scuba equipment. Perfect. Um, the next question, Christy is asking, um, are there any disinfectants on list in that are effective against the virus, but also safe for use around aquatic life or reef safe? How would yeah. you go about determining whether those- okay. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I know that a lot of these products are quaternary ammonium compounds, which are commonly just called quats. Um, and these aren't, you know, safe for their environment. There have been studies that show that they can be harmful. So the best practice, if you're concerned, is to, you know, use, uh, the best practice in general is to sanitize or disinfect your gear and then rinse. So you're not making a big rinse tank of disinfectant and then just using that. So what you can do is have a smaller container of this disinfectant solution and then rinse in fresh water and then make sure that you're disposing of the disinfectant solution in a way that's going to actually take it to a water treatment facility. You're not just like dumping it out in the grass or dumping it out in the water near you. Okay, all good to know. Um, we have another question coming in talking about um, practices for filling cylinders and stuff like that. And Russ is asking, so if good hand hygiene is practiced, is there a need to disinfect cylinders and reg first stages, et cetera? Thanks in advance. Yeah, so this is kind of, I'm just personally, like I'm a little bit of a germaphobe. So I know that I'm practicing good hand hygiene, but I don't know what everybody else is doing, right? So in that regard, disinfecting regularly is always a really good idea, just because, you know, you can wash your hands and you only really know that your hands are clean after you've dried them off, right? You could touch something else. So hand hygiene coupled with regular disinfection is really the key to reducing the spread. Perfect. And more questions coming in. So Angie is asking, um, for a max clean, would you recommend using hot water to make a bleach solution or cool water? Is that gonna make a difference? Um, I would I would say just don't like use hot water. The water that comes out of your tap or hose is probably just fine. Um, you just we just know that hot water is going to decompose the active ingredient in bleach. Was that the question? Yeah, um, she's saying that Clorox says their bleach is effective in hot, warm, or cold water. But for Max Clean, you should use hot water. Um, but you're saying room temperature, so we're just clarifying that okay, room temperature. Okay, well, I mean, I would def if the directions are saying to do something, I would definitely go with the directions on the bottle as opposed to, to what I'm saying. Um, if, if their products are effective in hot water, that's great. Um, you just would be then concerned with the temperature of the water that you're using and if it's going to affect your equipment. Perfect. And here's a great question coming from Costas. He's asking, what about the inner part of the second stage regulators? Do we have recommendations for getting those effectively disinfected all up on the inside? Yeah, so, um, so by the inside of the second stage regulator, I'm gonna assume that you're talking about not the hose, but just the actual second stage, because what happens is um, as it, since it's a demand regulator, you're going to breathe in and it's gonna open that inlet that lets air you know, into your mouth. And then once you start to exhale, it's gonna close. So we're not really worried about the virus getting up into the hose. We're just worried about where your exhaled breath is gonna go on the inside of the regulator. So for this reason, a spray or like a wipe isn't really probably gonna get into all of these possibly contaminated little crevices of the second stage. Um, immersing it in a solution is probably best because it's gonna get into all of these little places. Um, a spray or a wipe, you know, it's better than nothing. So if you're in a pinch or you're on the boat and you want to just make sure this thing is really clean, those are great, really great um, things to have on hand. But in terms of like primary disinfecting, immersing it in a solution is probably best. Okay, it looks like we're getting a lot of questions on UV light. So what about UV light? Is that yeah. an effective disinfectant for dive gear or... What would we say on that? We haven't looked into UV light in terms of dive, disinfecting dive gear because, again, it's like you'd have to take apart everything to expose it all to the light, which isn't going to be probably very practical. Right. 
And uh, speaking of taking things apart, closed circuit rebreathers have a lot of different working parts. Do you have any suggestions for disinfecting rebreathers as opposed to normal open circuit setups? Yeah, um, for that, I would go to kind of those um, governing bodies of rebreathers. I'm personally not a rebreather diver, um, so I don't know a ton about disinfecting them. Um, so going to one of your governing bodies, I know that a couple of them have come out with statements about disinfection in terms of COVID-19, so I would refer to that. Perfect. And one more question on a disinfectant. So Vercon is a powerful disinfectant used by a lot of zoos, aquariums, and other places, and in the rebreather world, people use it. Do we recommend using Vercon on scuba equipment? Um, does it have any bad effects on the equipment itself that you know of? To be clear, we don't like recommend certain products. We just refer to what we know. We refer to the EPA registration. Is it safe to use on scuba equipment? Um, I have looked into Vercon, and I'm actually pretty unclear about that one. It has all of the materials in it, like in the registration, it specifies a bunch of materials that you would find in scuba equipment, but it does not explicitly say that it is safe to use on scuba, dive equipment, any or any type of respirator. So that one, you know, if you can switch, um, you might consider it. But again, if you really would like me to look into Vercon more, I absolutely can. And you can email me at riskmitigation at dan.org. Perfect. And one final question. It looks like we're running out of time here, so we may not have time to get to all your questions, but rest assured we will be able to respond to you individually if you reach out to us at riskmitigation at dan.org or if you reply in the comments. This video will be available for view later as soon as this live stream ends, just um, to answer that question on that front. Um, but the final question here, what is the contact time recommended for that CDC bleach recipe? Do you have that on top yeah. of your CDC, head or? Sorry, the CDC does have a contact time for their solution. It's one minute. Perfect. So one minute. That's pretty easy. And um, a lot of people are asking for the PowerPoint. We will do what we can to try and get that posted so you guys can uh, reference that. But again, our video will live on our Facebook page. So feel free to play this at your dive clubs to all of your dive buddies out there. Um, we definitely encourage any of you guys to share this. But uh, I think that about wraps it up for now. Chloe, anything to add? Yeah, um, I, the only thing I have to add is that, you know, we're here to answer your questions. So if there's any question that you have about disinfection or diving in the future, you know, and how COVID-19 might affect that, please email us at riskmitigation at dan.org. And if you have a medical question about diving after COVID-19, email medic at dan.org. Perfect. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. Hope you have a great rest of your day and stay safe out there. Also stay tuned because we're going to be coming at you with more webinars in the future. Catch you later.